The History of Osirian One of the first civilizations to rise in the wake of Earthfall, Osirian is also one of the greatest human empires in the history of Galarian, a nation of great knowledge, wealth, and power. This ancient land harbors pyramids, mummies, terrible curses, and, of course, the endless sands of the desert. The Garundi people first settled along the southern shores of the Inner Sea in the now-forgotten years of the Age of Anguish. Nomads who traveled in clans of related families. They eventually put down permanent roots to become farmers and shepherds along the fertile banks of the Sphinx River, but continued to war with one another until a man named Asgad came to power. Asgad had met a mysterious stranger named Nethys, a being not quite a god but still possessing immense power, who imbued Asgad with his magic and taught him how to unite the squabbling clans. Though the clans initially balked when Asgad, channeling the full might of Nethys, destroyed Ulunat, the spawn of Rovagug that had terrorized Kasmaran in northern Garen for hundreds of years, the clans proclaimed Asgad their first god-king, or pharaoh. Pharaoh Asgad ordered the clans to work together to build a new city in the shadow of the shell of Ulunat, so that it would serve as a constant reminder of a true ruler's power. In minus 3470, he founded the capital city of Sothis, after the ancient Assyriani name for Sinosher, the North Star. This date usually marks the beginning of the Age of Destiny. In the early years of Assyrian, the great sorcerer Nethys ruled the new kingdom of Assyrian with Pharaoh Asgad as his public face, until Nethys's ascension to actual divinity led him to leave the mortal world behind. For more details on Nethys and his ascension, please see the third episode of my series on the religions of the Pathfinder world. After Nethys' ascension in the year minus 3399, the pharaoh Asgad had a magnificent temple built to the all-seeing eye in Sothis and proclaimed Nethys to be Assyrian's patron deity. Asgad himself, whose own mortal life was extended by Nethys' divine sorcery, went on to live another 87 years, only dying at the ripe old age of 188. He was succeeded in minus 3312 by his chosen successor, the Naga pharaoh. Where Nethys blessed the pharaoh Asgad, he cursed the Naga pharaoh. He haunted her dreams and filled them with violent visions and nightmarish prophecies, until her mind snapped and all that was left was uncontrollable destructive rage. In her madness, she tore down the Temple of the All-Seeing Eye and laid waste to countless other monuments, beginning a thankfully short downward spiral in the fledgling nation's early history. It is unclear whether it was the Naga pharaoh or Asgad himself who started the Crimson Canal, but one of those early pharaohs did commission that lifeline of Sothis that remains important to the city even today. In minus 3250, in the deserts west of Osirian, in the land that is modern-day Thuvia, nomadic warlords established the Tekritanan League, controlling the lands between the new nation of Osirian and the slightly older Jiska Imperium further west. Unlike its two rivals, the government of the Tekritanan League was largely decentralized, being composed of numerous semi-autonomous city-states. Shortly after the establishment of the League to their immediate west, Osirian pharaohs who succeeded the Naga pharaohs' short-lived reign marched into what is now Katapesh, Nex, and Geb with little opposition, intent on expanding their influence and power throughout the region. During this period, a short-lived ruler named Pharaoh An ascended to power in Osirian. This was likely sometime around the year minus 3100. This pharaoh had delusions of grandeur, and he believed himself as powerful as the god Nethys had been in life. Driven to the brink of insanity by his conviction, pharaoh An gathered a huge contingent of slaves and sycophants and traveled south, past the salt hills, to the feet of the brazen peaks. There, his wizards told him he might access the same mysterious power that fueled Nethys's own apotheosis. While Pharaoh An wandered the peaks looking for this power source, his mad followers built a series of inverted pyramids made entirely of precious gems. These structures were to serve as Pharaoh An's first temples when the ruler claimed divinity. However, some terrible thing happened to the Pharaoh and his followers up in the mountains, and neither the Pharaoh nor his acolytes ever returned from there. After Pharaoh An, the next significant pharaoh to take over during the First Age was a pharaoh known as the Pharaoh of Forgotten Plagues. Now, in this period west of Osirian, the Tekritanan League and the Jiska Imperium rivaled the Kingdom of Osirian for wealth, power, and influence, at least until minus 3064, when the pharaoh of Forgotten Plagues captured a powerful Ifriti commander of the Jiskan military. The pharaoh's necromancers, known as the Usij, transformed the genie into an undead ghoul and sent him home, carrying a magically engineered disease called the Night Plague that only targeted Jiska's noble houses. With the nation's leadership in shambles, Jiskin power waned over the following centuries. 
Despite this success, the pharaoh of forgotten plagues would not get a chance to revel in the glory of his cunning, as he was murdered and deposed by the song pharaoh in minus 3047, who was in turn killed and deposed by Jetrieti I, also known as the masked pharaoh who usurped the throne and ushered in a long line of cruel and decadent rulers whose gluttonous appetites began to lead to Assyrian's first decline. Jetrieti's line ruled Assyrian for almost 200 years. After Jetrieti I was buried at the Pyramid of Masks, he was succeeded by Jetrieti II, who in turn was succeeded by Jetrieti III, or the Pharaoh of Singing Sands, who was succeeded by Jetrieti IV and Jetrieti V, also called the insatiable pharaoh, whose greed led him to plunder the tombs of his predecessors. Those actions, in minus 2885, led to the spirits of the dead pharaohs learning to reanimate themselves as mummies, which in turn led to the first Assyrian conflict with the pharaonic mummy kings. The insatiable pharaoh was finally replaced by Jetrieti VI, the last of the Jetrieti line to rule Assyrian. In the minus 2850s, the Jetrieti dynasty was succeeded by the Sekpa Mefer pharaohs, the most notable of which was Sekpa Mefer III, the so-called Pharaoh of Sphinxes, who was a well-documented friend of Sphinxes that lived in the deserts of Assyrian, and who was at the center of the standalone Pathfinder module, Risen from the Sands. By minus 2764, the long, slow machinations kicked off by the Pharaoh of Forgotten Plagues finally reached its grim conclusions, and the Jiska Imperium collapsed in the west. After defeating its major rival in the region, Osirian continued to grow in power and influence. Also around this period, the Anhepsu dynasty rose to power, starting with Pharaoh Anhepsu I, also known as the Pharaoh of Seven Faces, whose achievements, symbols, and likenesses were carved on the seven stele in the western deserts of Osirian. This new golden age saw the founding of the cities of Totra, Ipek, Tefu, and Wati. The dynasty lasted through the reign of Anhepsu XI, who was violently deposed in minus 1768. The period of the First Age of Assyrian following the fall of the Anhepsu dynasty has a spotty historical tracking. The known pharaohs who ruled Assyrian in this period include Anhepsu XI's successor, Chemuzar I, who ruled from minus 1768 to minus 1757 until he was murdered in his sleep and fed to the river crocodiles, which was followed by a year-long interregnum period where it is reported that there was no pharaoh at all. Then came Pharaoh Sekhemib I's ascension in minus 1756, and he ruled to some unknown date that's been lost to history. At some point thereafter, Pharaoh Dejeret I ascended the throne. His line would be the last line to rule Assyrian during what is considered to be the First Age. Jedaret I was the pharaoh who ordered the construction of the face of the Bronze Man, a massive bronze-faced likeness of himself on the side of a mountain in the Brazen Peaks, where the eyes of the Bronze Man mines are located. Upon his death in minus 1653, Jedaret I was succeeded by his son, who was crowned Pharaoh Hakatep I. Unlike many of the previous pharaohs of the First Age, he was well-liked, intelligent, and confident. During his popular reign, Assyrian prospered. Eventually, Hakatep chose a dark-eyed beauty of noble blood named Neferizet as his first wife. His advisers spoke against the match, because Neferizet, by the age of 16, had already earned a sinister reputation as an oracle of the dark tapestry. Hakatep didn't listen to them, and wed Neferizet regardless, vowing to take no other wives during his reign. The last decades of Hakatep's reign were tainted by his obsession with the neighboring nation of the Shori Empire, and the management of his increasingly unstable wife, whose obsession for the dark space between the stars and the strange beings that lived there led her to madness. Hakatep was convinced that the Shori Empire would invade Assyrian, and ordered the construction of Kepsutanem, now known as the Slave Trenches of Hakatep. It was to be a powerful weapon that could draw the Shori's flying city down from the sky. However, the wars between Assyrian and the Shori Empire were ineffectual and cost a great number of Assyrian lives. The only gain was the development of Hakatep's Great Flying Pyramid, a tomb for himself and his queen, for which great work Pharaoh Hakatep I named himself the Sky Pharaoh. Before the completion of his great weapon, Hakatep was afflicted with a recurrent disease of astonishing virulence, and he died in minus 1611. His beloved wife took her own life by drinking serpent venom, and was laid to rest in the flying pyramid that was their legacy. With no surviving children, Hakatep was succeeded by his nephew, Jedaret II, who put great effort into undoing much of his predecessor's legacy. Though Jedaret II ended the war with the Shori Empire, the damage was done. Assyrian's power declined quickly thereafter, leaving its people to suffer through centuries of poor leadership, foreign invasions, and internal strife. It is not known what year Jedaret's rule ended, nor who was the last pharaoh, or possibly the set of competing pharaohs, at the end of the First Age. The nation's next great moment came in minus 1498, when the four pharaohs of Ascension, each of whom controlled a small portion of the country, decided to pool their strength and rule as one. 
This ushered in Osirian's second age. The four restored many of its former glories, moving the capital to the newly built city of Tumen, and finally defeating the Tecratanan League in minus 1452. After nearly 70 years of enlightened rule, they died together as they had sworn. Sadly, their successors were unable to build on their achievements, and the nation once again slipped into stagnation. In minus 1431, with the four pharaohs' rule ended, the empire moved back to a single pharaoh in charge, and the capital was moved back to Sothis, and the new capital of two men was soon abandoned. The exact lineage of individual pharaohs after minus 1431 is lost to time, but some 300 years after the four pharaohs' period ended, circa minus 1116, the notable pharaoh Kenaton I ruled. He was a pious ruler known for magically imprisoning the Hierakosphinx Heftethnet, who terrorized southern Assyrian during his reign. His rule was followed by a dynasty of pharaohs known as the Apsu dynasty. In minus 929, the exiled necromancer Geb exerted his influence in Assyrian's southernmost province. The empire eventually ceded it to Geb's control. Shortly thereafter, in minus 849, the Apsu dynasty ended, and the Yafeha dynasty began. The line of Pharaoh Yafeha I ruled Assyrian for almost three quarters of a millennium, until Pharaoh Hirkashek I rose to power, kicking off the Hirkashek dynasty in minus 107. In any case, the Apsu dynasty lost the conquered Tekratanan lands when high theurgist Fentet Pesu, the Assyrian governor of Thuvia, was assassinated by one of his favored consorts in the regional capital of El Amara. Assyrian effectively ceded control of all lands west of the Janira River when Pharaoh Yafeha I failed to send a new governor. Those lands would become independent and later name the new loosely aligned coalition of city-states Thuvia, the name it carries today. Another notable event to come out of the Yafeha dynasty was the establishment of a pact with the water elementals of the Haite clan, negotiated by Pharaoh Osezis II, that regulated the somewhat destructive annual flooding of the Sphinx River. This agreement led to longer planting seasons, ending a nationwide famine and ushering in a steady increase in Assyrians' population over the following decades. The Herkoshek dynasty lasted from minus 107 to the year 181. This pharaonic dynasty included Herkoshek I and II, Pharaoh Zahur I and II, Pharaoh Gebesek and his great number of short-lived successors, the infamous Cameria the Brazen, who ruled continuously from minus 21 to 159, and was particularly notable for being the only pharaoh to have openly worshipped Rovagag, and finally culminating in Cameria's son, Gebesek IX, known as the Healer, the end of whose reign in 181 marked the end of that particular dynasty. They were succeeded by the Ramses dynasty, of whom Ramses IV is particularly notable because during his reign, the cult of Rovagug re-established themselves in a temple within the Pyramid of Cameria. Ramses IV initially dealt harshly with the cult, but then decided it was better to allow them to establish themselves within the pyramid, rather than have them organize elsewhere in secret. This policy was followed by subsequent pharaohs. In roughly the year 250, Pharaoh Menades I, who confusingly also named himself a sky pharaoh, was the first ruler of the last native dynasty of Assyrian's pharaohs prior to the Kadiran invasion. His likeness adorns the Black Sphinx in the desert west of Shimansek, and the Sphinx contains his royal tomb. Finally, we get to 1532. That last dynasty would end, along with Assyrian self-rule altogether. The last pharaoh, Menades XXVI, was deposed by forces of the Padishah Empire of Kalesh, and he would be the last pharaoh of Assyrian until Assyrian's Third Age, which would begin only after Kaleshite occupation would end. This is how it happened. Over the previous thousand years, a cold war had been brewing between the great powerful Padishah Empire of Kalesh and the growing Avestinian Empire of Taldor, with whom they shared a northern border. The support Taldor received from the living god Aradin, who raised the great city of Absalom from the seafloor, gave the Western Empire an edge over the Padishah Empire that could only be compensated for with greater land and resources. They turned their attention westwards for further conquests and influence. Sensing Assyrians' weakness in the period, the nation of Kadira, the westernmost satrapy of the mighty empire of Kalesh, determined that that nation was ripe for the taking. Agents from Kadira created instability within Assyrian, leading to a series of slave revolts that further destabilized the corrupt bureaucracy of the last pharaoh. Pharaoh Menades XXVI was forced into hiding, and he was replaced by the Kadiran satrap Zerbistes I. The Padishah Empire assigned Zerbistes a vizier named Guyun to advise him, but gave the satrap total gubernatorial control over both Kadira and Assyrian. For 700 years, Kadira satraps would rule Assyrian from their capital of Kathir, installing royal viziers in Sothis to handle local affairs. Thousands of Kelishites migrated across the Abari Ocean to seek their fortune in this ancient land. 
for the first time turning Osirian into a nation of two distinct traditions. These immigrants brought along their worship of the goddess Sarenre, and it was ironically a member of this religion who finally brought about the fall of Osirian's foreign rulers. A militant Sarenite sect called the Cult of the Dawnflower killed the ruling satrap in 2253, replacing him with a local sultan and proclaiming Osirian to be an independent Kelishite kingdom. This new nation did less to suppress the ambitions of the native Gurundi population, leading to a great flowering of traditional Assyrian culture towards the end of the 23rd century. However, these new political arrangements would continue relatively unchanged for the next 2300 years, with Kelish Saranite caliphs ruling the new land as an independent caliphate. These new caliphs managed to maintain Assyriani independence from the greater Padishah Empire, but they lacked the resources to hold on to all of the empire's conquered territory. In 3250, for example, the nation of Katapesh broke free from Assyrian rule and became an independent nation. Then, the death of the god Aradan in 4606 led to widespread natural disasters and panic throughout the inner sea region, and Assyrian was not immune to these upheavals. Terrible storms lashed its coasts for weeks, and the rivers Sphinx, Asp, and Crook flooded disastrously, leading to severe food shortages. The caliph and his family were killed in a tornado that devastated Sothis. With no clear leader in place, members of a nativist Gurundi organization called the Children of Wajet seized power on behalf of a Gurundi cleric of Abadar from Absalom, known simply as Harun of Abadar. The children claimed that Harun was a direct descendant of Asgad, the first pharaoh of Assyrian, whose family had been living in exile for millennia. The Kelishite government and army, still in disarray from the disasters attending Aradin's death, could do little to oppose this chosen leader when he stepped off the ship in the port of Totra in 4608, and he was greeted by a multitude of grateful Assyrians. Months of protests followed in every major Assyrian city, demanding the Kelishite government's abdication and dissolution, but it was not until Harun sailed into Sothis itself, flanked by hundreds of obedient Hetkoshu crocodiles and a large contingent of loyal Gurundi soldiers, that the government relented. Harun took the name Kemet I at his coronation and quickly restored order throughout the land, becoming the first Assyrian pharaoh to sit on the throne in over 3,000 years. This brings us to the third and current age of Assyrian. Pharaoh Kemet I, also known as the Fourth Bringer, established a new dynasty starting in 4609. Three pharaohs have held the throne to this day. Kemet I, the Fourth Bringer, who ruled from 4609 to 4649. Kemet II, the Crocodile King, who ruled from 4649 to 4678, and Kemet III, the Ruby Prince, who has ruled from 4678 to present day. In 4707, the Ruby Prince instituted a radical new policy for the nation, when he began to open Assyrians' many ancient tombs to explorers from throughout the inner sea region. He understood that foreign adventurers who traveled there would most likely sell any artifacts they found to local markets in order to make an immediate profit, which in turn would provide a valuable boost to the Assyrian economy. In 4714, the events of the Mummy's Mask adventure path took place. I won't go into the details here, but suffice it to say that after the disastrous return of a vengeful pharaoh, Kemet III would later revert this policy, but so far has only succeeded in driving the tomb-robbing business underground. This, of course, brings us to today. The Lands of the Pharaohs. Now I will take a brief look at Assyrian's culture, politics, and society, and take an exploration of five prominent locations in this desert-bound nation. The Brazen Frontier, the Footprints of Rovagug, the Assyrian Desert, the Scorpion Coast, and the Sphinx Basin. First, let's touch on the kingdom overall. Pharaoh Kemet III, the Ruby Prince, is the third scion of the Gurundi Fourthbringer dynasty, to reign in Assyrian after 3,000 years of Kelish rule. The Ruby Prince's authority is absolute, like that of his distant pharaonic ancestors, and he sets all matters of foreign and domestic policy. In concession to the political developments of modern times, however, members of the dynasty are advised by the Council of Sun and Sky, a hundred-person legislature composed of wealthy merchants, important members of the clergy, minor nobles, and other individuals in the good graces of either the Ruby Prince or one of the governors who oversees the nation's many disparate regions. Each council member represents one of Assyrian's major cities and is charged with handling the day-to-day -day affairs of the national government, such as forging trade agreements, setting financial policy, allocating funds for the armed forces, and maintaining the nation's port streets and river locks. Regional matters are largely left to each region's governor. Established in 4610, the council meets in chambers beneath Sothis's Black Dome, and councillors are expected to advocate for the needs of their constituents, but most spend their time pursuing their own agendas. Because of Osirian's complicated history, 
Though the pharaoh himself is native of Syriani, the majority of the councillors are in fact of Kelish ethnicity. In fact, the Kelish minority continued to control the majority of the nation's wealth and influence, even under pharaonic rule. This is, of course, because until recently, the Kelish minority had ruled the country for over 3,000 years. Kelishites make up less than a fifth of its human population. Under the Kelishite caliphs, Gerundi were denied the best positions and trade contracts, and even though this prejudice had been embedded in national policy for over a century, the legacy of discrimination has left many of Assyrians' Kelishite families quite wealthy, while the Assyriani native Gerundi people make up well over 90% of the nation's poor. Another interesting fact about the ruling council is that five members of the Council of the Sun and Sky are elected to serve on the council from within the ranks of a secondary deliberative body, the Council of Liberated Slaves. This 63-person council composed entirely of former slaves and the children of slaves, is charged with overseeing the well-being of a Syrian slave population, but tends to advocate for the nation's freeborn poor as well. Outsiders may find it strange to elevate former chattel to seats within the government, but it has proven a workable compromise for a Syrian as the nation's ancient traditions confront the changing modern world. Slavery is one of Osirian's most deeply embedded cultural cornerstones. After all, slaves built many of the monumental statues and buildings of ancient Osirian. And even though slavery is not as common as it was a century ago, it's still common practice in the lands of the pharaohs. Inspired by the founding of the state of Andoran in 4669, and its declaration of the common rule that slavery be abolished everywhere, the slaves of Assyrian rose up and demanded similar reforms, no longer content to serve beneath their master's lashes. Caught between the potential for permanent economic harm posed by the prospect of abolition and the slave revolts that threatened to bring down his father's government, Kemet III instituted the laws of equitable use in 4679. These laws abolished hereditary slavery, established guidelines under which the government could place someone in slavery as punishment for criminal activity, prohibited harsh mistreatment of slaves and killing or marrying them against their wills, and chartered the Council of Liberated Slaves. This compromise ended the slave rebellions and restored order in Assyrian. Assyrian slaves today are considerably better off than their counterparts in other slaving nations, such as Cheliacs and Katapesh. The complicated history of Assyrian has also led to very many different religious traditions existing in the land. Since the Age of Destiny, the people of Assyrian have worshipped their own local gods, in addition to those deities venerated throughout the Inner Sea region. They were most popular during the early days of Assyrian, but their faith waned as the Assyrian people gradually turned to the worship of foreign deities. It is believed that sometime during the Age of Enthronement, the Assyrian gods, while continuing to guide Assyrian from afar, retreated from Galarian and turned their attention towards their worship on other distant worlds, including our own. When Osirian was under Kelishite rule, the foreign warlords sought to eradicate the faith in the indigenous gods, but they remain a part of the history of Osirian's land and people, and with the restoration of native Osirian rule, interest in these ancient divinities has been rekindled. Beyond these traditional beast-headed deities, the god Nethys is one of the most prominently worshipped gods in the region, as Nethys was once an Osiriani human himself, and he helped establish the first pharaonic dynasty over 8,000 years ago. Saren Ray is also a culturally important deity in the land, as it is the faith of the Kelish people brought with them when they conquered Assyrian over 3,000 years ago, and it continues to be the dominant faith of Assyrian's Kelish minority. Kemet I, the fourth bringer himself, and the first new pharaoh in 3,000 years, was a cleric of Abadar. So unsurprisingly, Abadar has seen a good deal of increased worship across the native Gerundi population, who saw Pharaoh Kemet I as a great savior for their people. Finally, Osirian has a long and difficult history with undeath, with necromancy being practiced by both ancient pharaohs and by ancient enemies like the Gebites to the south. As a result, worship of pharasma is both widespread and common. Many Osiriani of all ethnic backgrounds, in fact, worship a mix of all these deities, depending on their needs and concerns in the moment. One more deity is worth calling out among all these. Osirian worshippers of Aurori are also fairly numerous, but they tend to cluster in isolated communities and valleys among the Barrier Wall and Brazen Peaks. And notable places of worship include the Temple of Analak in the Salt Hills, the Steppe Tower of Jedifar on the Alamein Peninsula, and the ritual center of the Monastery of Tarquata beyond the footprints of Rovagug. Let's now discuss Osirian's political and societal outlook today. In spite of the wealth inequity, the continued reliance on slavery, the long and painful history of Kelish occupation, and the legacy of the consequent Gerundi discrimination, spirits in Osirian are higher than they've ever been. Pharaoh Kemet III has overseen Osirian's continued economic growth in recent years, and this steep rise has sparked interest for many nations in the region, and Absalom, Cheliax, Andoran, Kadira, and Taldor in particular are all eager to increase their diplomatic trade relations with the land of the pharaohs. 
For his part, the Ruby Prince has treated most of these nations' inquiries with marked indifference, and he continues to keep his true geopolitical intentions very close to his chest. Regardless, this rapid economic growth has led to resurgence in confidence in the nation, and a growing interest in traditional Assyriani culture and history. Even its migrant Kelish minority have lived there long enough now, and consider themselves Assyriani enough, to feel a swell of national pride at the long-storied history of the country, or at the sight of the vast monuments built by the pharaohs of the ancient world. That the fourth bringer pharaohs have allowed the Kelish minority to retain their wealth and influence has meant that this group has over the last hundred years become great supporters of the new ruler. Their wealth and influence has also continued to grow in the last hundred years, but now, as they are quick to point out, there is greater opportunity for all. The flag of Assyrian features ancient symbols of the country, the twin serpent heads of Wajet and Apep, the swelling sun of Ra, plus the golden scarab of Kepri with its wings spread wide. The colors of the nation are the traditional colors of the pharaohs, gleaming polished gold, and the bright blue of lapis lazuli. For many Assyriani, the new flag represents something that has been absent in the nation for many millennia, hope, and the growing prospect of a bright future. The Brazen Frontier the Brazen Frontier takes its name from the Brazen Peaks, a ragged but pass-riven stretch of high mountains that creates a natural if porous border between Assyrian and Katapesh to the south. The mountains stretch from the Korarn Pass in the west to the shores of the Obari Ocean in the east. Numerous passes wind through the mountains, but the savage knolls and dangerous wildlife of the region make overland trade and travel across the mountains a treacherous proposition. Runoff from the Brazen Peaks is the main source of both the Asp and Crook rivers, which form the eastern and northern borders of the region, respectively. The many rivers and streams that etch the land between the mountains and the major rivers cause the soil to be more fertile than it is anywhere in Assyrian save the Sphinx Basin. The land remains largely untamed and unpeopled, however, because of the inimical local monsters and wildlife, as well as the territorial or violent nature of its non-human inhabitants. Most of the region's civilized inhabitants live within a few miles of the Crook, including a large farming population surrounding the city of Ipek, the only major settlement in the area. Outside of Ipek, the Brazen Frontier is primarily populated by a combination of humans and Pamet dwarves, the former in small villages and settlements scattered across the uplands, the latter inhabiting a variety of harsh locales that they guard ferociously. Outside of these settled areas, Knolls reign supreme, and even claim a large number of settlements for themselves. Places of interest in the region include Erecrus. The Pamet, known colloquially as the Sand Dwarves, are a dwarven subrace endemic to the deserts and mountains of northern Garand. Erecrus is the largest of several Pamet dwarf settlements, built into the side of the Brazen Peaks on the border with Katapesh. But it is much more than a mere settlement, and its fame across Assyrian is well deserved. The cavern system houses perhaps the most exclusive necropolis in Assyrian, where many of the most renowned and well-loved pharaohs of old lie buried, including Osezis II and Menades XVII. The Pamet choose only the true of heart to slumber under their mountain, so many pharaohs have tried to bribe their way in despite their failed deeds. Fort Fang. The knolls of the Brazen Frontier are largely nomadic raiders, but they do have some permanent redoubts, the largest and most imposing of which is Fort Fang. This terrible bastion is part slave pit, part treasury, and part barracks. Ruled by the self-styled knoll pharaoh of Fangs, the augmented ruin is the likely destination for any human captives who, for whatever reason, the knolls have decided not to consume for food. Ipek. Ipek is not a city built organically over the centuries by human hands. It is rather an organic human city laid over a military-driven, genie-generated plan. Its location blocking the shallows, its artificially fortified hills, and its high and almost gateless walls all point to its genesis as a fortress. On Hepsu VII, the pharaoh of blades, used all of his pull with his noble genie allies to construct the city and its wall and barracks. Ipek flourished along strictly military lines for centuries, but in recent millennia it has acted more as a hub for local commerce. Many of the barracks are now markets or apartments, the inner walls overrun by ivy and flowering vines. Ipek stands on the southern bank of the Crook River, completely blocking the shallows of Ipek, one of only three ways of crossing the Crook on foot. The shallows are a remarkable feature, a placid, slow-moving stretch of river with water no more than five feet deep. The city itself sports two square hills on either side of the main road, their regular angles and identical height a testament to their magical provenance. The highest-ranking member of Assyrian's military currently living in Epek is Sefir Etis, a Garundi commander in the Risen Guard. Etis is occupied almost exclusively with military matters, especially those regarding the Risen Guard's operation in the region, and is rarely interested in the politics of Epek. 
Though Ipek is still primarily a military town, and most of the money that flows through its street is a result, directly or indirectly, of the Ruby Prince's desire to see the southern border remain secure, the money does not flow as abundantly as it once did. Foreseeing the end of an era, Councillor Sol Jatet has been making plans to wean the city off the military subsidies and towards trade with the rest of Assyrian and beyond. The economic projects include converting more farmland to cotton production and building a series of outposts to protect the southern caravan routes from marauding knolls. If this route were safe, the thinking goes, Ipek could steal much of the trade that currently rounds the Burning Cape by sea. Safani, the Hidden Village Safani is located near the Crook, about halfway between Ipek and Oxjaw Falls. It's the largest upriver settlement and somewhat beyond the protection of regular Ipek patrols. Safani has developed a unique defense against knoll raiders. It hides from them. The village of nearly 500 people is made up of sod houses set into the sides of hills and ravines. Brush and vegetation are deliberately cultivated in such a way that they can be shifted over the doors and windows of the dwellings, leaving an eerily empty patch of farmland and vegetable gardens. Lookouts on a nearby tower alert the settlement to intruders, and the town militia harries Knowles on their way before they can study the landscape closely enough to wreak havoc. The settlement is led by Efni Ran, a former member of an elite Osiriani scout company. She manages the disappearing act, keeping the deception up to near military standards. The Slave Trenches of Hakotep The Slave Trenches of Hakotep are a sprawling collection of earthworks located northeast of the Korarn Pass, near the headwaters of the Crook. The trenches are so named because between each set of mounds and ridges lie trenches full of tens of thousands of bones, presumably the remains of the slaves of Hakotep I, the pharaoh who caused the trenches to be built. The works are also dotted with thousands of eroded obelisks, each containing a bound elemental. Their only current known effect is to cause several minor earthquakes a year. No one knows the exact functioning of the earthworks, but leading theories posit that they are some sort of magical or mundane defense against attacks from the Shori Empire to the south. Still more obscure rumors, unsubstantiated by any reputable scholarly work, speak of the trenches in relation to an artifact called the Amber Chronograph, said to count the hours until the stars go out. Regardless, strange magic continues to work here. The restive dead of this site rise frequently. Elemental spirits possess the bodies of the dead slaves and use these forms to continue their task of endlessly clearing the site of the relentlessly encroaching desert. The Footprints of Rovagug the region known as the Footprints of Rovagug is the swath of rocky badlands in southwestern Assyrian, bordered by the Scarab River to the north and the parched dunes to the west. The stony, barren land extends up to the Barrier Wall Mountains and includes the northwestern peaks of that range. Although filled with arid dirt and dry clay rather than sand, this region is just as harsh as Assyrian's dune-filled deserts and presents many of its own dangers. Fierce monsters haunt the ruins of these forsaken lands. During the first age of Osirian, several ambitious pharaohs constructed temples and tombs in the barrier wall, far from the teeming capital of Sothis. Some of the great projects from those days were destroyed in earthquakes or buried under volcanic ash, but many remain intact, enticing explorers to the region. With their previous humanoid residents displaced by disasters or cursed with undeath, those forgotten locations now crumble around their ancient treasures. Because greenery is so sparse in the footprints of Rovagug, monstrous inhabitants must venture far to gather sustenance, and as a result, winged monsters such as manticores, wyverns, and dragons are common. Treasure seekers in the region frequently encounter sphinxes, or their humanoid kin, the isolationist Meftets. Unfortunately, intelligent or kind-hearted sphinxes, such as gynosphinxes, are rare in the region. Much more common are bestial hierachosphinxes, or cryosphinxes, who eagerly defend their hunting grounds from trespassers. Osirian's two active volcanoes are both found near this region as well, making this bleak area rich in geothermal activity. Asulek's mouth is a fiery hell that rains ash and fire for miles in every direction on a regular basis. Sokar's boil is a simmering menace, quiescent for the past three millennia, but liable to erupt in a cataclysmic explosion at any time. Other features of the area, such as the cinder cones and the numerous hot springs, likewise are of volcanic and geothermic origins. The most unique volcanic landmarks, and the feature that give the region its name, are massive sheets of dried lava that sprawl across the badlands like three-toed footprints. Places of interest in the region include the Aphet Mines. Deposits of copper and iron dot the northeastern face of the Barrier Wall Mountains. Throughout Assyrian's long history, the larger deposits were fully exhausted to fuel the pharaoh's endless demands for weapons and ornamentation. The most productive remaining mines, and the only ones operated by more than a handful of enterprising homesteaders, are three interconnected copper mines called the Aphet Mines. 
The AFIT mines operate only quasi-legally, as the multinational Aspis Consortium recently secured the mineral rights in a series of questionable political maneuvers. The overseer, a Chelish silver agent named Falsen Deek, uses his mastery of stone and minerals to locate untapped copper deposits and maintain the mine's high output. Deke keeps a contingent of mercenaries on hand to deter and quell rebellion. The mines provide a front for consortium operations in Assyrian and allow the organization to move contraband and personnel in and out of the nation under the auspices of managing the mines' functions. A small community called Aphet East has sprung up near the mines to provide services and trade goods to the miners. Jeneg A day's walk northwest of the head of the Crook River, a chain of mineral springs lie close together in a trio of shallow valleys. The largest of these springs, the Great Pool, is shielded from view by a low rise. These mineral springs, cooler than most springs in the area, free of poisonous gases and relatively easy to reach, have been a favorite retreat of Assyrian nobility for millennia. The nobles bathe and engage in their intrigues privately, while their sycophantic courtiers occupy the lesser springs in descending order of station. The village of Jeneg grew up around the springs to cater to travelers and enforce the traditional class restrictions dictating who may bathe in which spring. High walls of stone top the rise in order to further shield the great pool from eavesdroppers, and the pool's attendants are selected from deaf commoners who are trained to look discreetly away from bathing dignitaries, except as their functions require. Many Assyrian nobles consider the great pool a safe place to relax and discuss sensitive state business, although Jeneg has its share of blackmailers, chiselers, and information brokers. The settlement's charismatic Kalashite mayor, Pofata the Hostess, herself knows of a few flaws in the privacy walls where a perceptive eavesdropper can catch snippets of conversations in the Great Pool. Tarquata. The most notable community in the region is Tarquata, the monastery of Aruri, built high in the barrier wall mountains. Tarquata would be ranked as a small village elsewhere in Galarian, and it's only a fraction of the size of the secular settlements of Aphet East and Jeneg. However, its isolated and unusual nature make it one of the most famous monasteries in the region, and its fame extends even beyond Assyrian's borders. Far removed from civilization, the monastery of Tarquata is difficult to reach, but is populated by many devoted mystics and a small communal village of laborers and pilgrims. In 1490, a Sothan priest of Irori named Narmek Tarquata ascended a remote mountain and founded a monastery on the peak's southern flank. He served as a master of the monastery for 90 years, teaching generations of Irori's followers and communing with the spirits of the air around the windy peak. The mountain and the monastery now bear Tarquata's name, and the priest is widely regarded as a saint. Although most of Tarquata's mortal remains have been spread around the world as sacred relics, his skull and spine, now sheathed in gold, rest within a reliquary at the top of the high spire. The air spirits from Tarquata's day still defend the spire and its reliquary from thieves and intruders. These unseen disciples have become a local legend. Junior monks debate whether or not these mythical figures even exist, while the monastery's master merely smiles. The monks occupy a sprawling series of halls carved into the mountain where they pursue a strict regimen of meditation, devotion, and exercise, seeking perfection of body and soul. Approximately 15 monks are in residence at any time, although the exact number varies as monks make journeys in the outer world to test their skills and pilgrims or aspirants visit the monastery. The current head of the monastery is Itefta the Immaculate, a surprisingly young Garundi man possessed of insightful wisdom, a gentle demeanor, and sly wit. Although most of the valley's residents are humans of ancient Gerundi ethnicity, a contemplative dwarf monastic order called the Wat occupies a series of caves in the high northern portion of the valley. The Wat, who consist mainly of Palmet dwarves, eschew traditional dwarven ways in favor of a path they believe can usher them towards perfection. The leader of these dwarves, Menka Helg, is a stern woman who sees isolationism as the only defense of her people's ancient ways. The Assyrian Desert the Assyrian desert comprises the bulk of Assyrian's land, and is as forbidding a territory as any on Garand. The desert is largely trackless, as its shifting sands and scouring Kamsin winds soon overwhelm roads and structures. Rocky outcroppings thrust into the sky throughout the desert, often providing the only landmarks by which to navigate, and these sites and settlements that survive the elements do so by huddling for protection. Often, however, the great expanse shows nothing but sky and sand in all directions. The history of the Assyrian desert reflects the nation's history and culture as an eternal cycle. When Assyrian is weak, the desert forms an insuperable barrier. When Assyrian is strong, its rulers adorn the desert with new tombs, monuments, and places of power. In time, the sands reclaim these new ornaments, sending them to join those sleeping in their depths, and new rulers rise to power and attempt to make their mark on the desert, however temporarily. 
the Assyrian desert is the most sparsely populated region of Assyria. Outside of the pleasure city of Shimansek and the trade hub of Ito, the desert is home only to nomadic Yerbira tribesfolk and the Varanoi clan of sand elves, roving clans of indigenous wanderers with ancient bloodlines. Hospitality is an art form to the Yerbira and the Varanoi, and they are fast friends and useful guides to those who can gain their trust. Places of interest in the region include Ito. Just north of the Pillars of the Sun, Ito is the hub where most of the roads through the Assyrian desert converge. The caravan routes that cross the desert are at best marked by guideposts, and at worst traversed only via celestial navigation and memory, but they all include Ito, the largest and most accessible city in the region. Shimansek is a wonderful place for those who can afford its luxuries, but Ito is the true heart of the region, and any adventurer who sifts the sands of the Assyrian desert is likely to visit Ito at some point. As a frontier town, Ito also appeals to the unscrupulous sort. Ito is divided into several districts, variously quiet or rowdy, all surrounding the Ito Bazaar at the center of town. The bazaar is a non-stop riot of activity, save for a few hours around midday when the shopkeepers close their stalls to the angry sun. The only permanent structure in the Ito Bazaar is the government house, a tall stone building that serves as accommodations for the governor and his staff. Currently, this governor is a shrewd inquisitor of Abadar named Asep Ma. Shimansek. Shimansek is among the oldest extant cities in Assyria, constructed in minus 3407 by the Song Pharaoh as a pleasure retreat watered by the beautiful Golden Oasis. Pharaohs and dynasties rose and fell, sometimes violently, but whether Garundi or Kalashite, each new ruler has seen the benefit of having such a beautiful and isolated site available. Thus has Shimansek escaped ruin for thousands of years. An ancient earthen berm holds back the worst of the camps and winds. It keeps the shifting dunes of the deep desert from burying the city, situated just west of the Golden Oasis, and marks its western edge. The ancient towers of the Wind Wall overlook a city shaped by the Song Pharaoh into the form of a lotus blossom, echoing the beautiful and eerily artificial shape of the Golden Oasis itself. Unlike other pharaonic retreats, the Lotus Palace of the city's center is never vacant. Ancient tradition dictates that the palace's charms never go to waste. The current inhabitants are the Gurundi governor Jasa Pep and his Kalashite consort and arcane advisor Gef Moor. The economy of Shimansek is almost entirely based on the entertainment of the Assyrian elite, but the city is agriculturally self-sufficient, as the neighboring Golden Oasis provides ample fish, fowl, and farmland to feed the small city. The water birds of the oasis sport an incredible variety of brightly colored feathers, which form the fletching in Assyrian arrows and are exported throughout the inner sea. The Scorpion Coast On the Scorpion Coast, located in eastern Assyrian, wastelands obfuscate both ominous history and mysterious modernity. The region's shifting sands and barren dunes cunningly hide a slew of ancient wonders which have drawn adventurers to this perilous area for thousands of years, and driven more than a few to their deaths. By comparison, the hardy souls who call the region home are resilient, and many are resolved to forge a new future for themselves, independent of the coast's pharaonic past. Vast danger and untold opportunities for wealth, power, and adventure in the midst of a relentless desert are the offerings of the Scorpion Coast. Scattered among the Scorpion Coast's varied natural features are the ruined monuments from one of humanity's oldest existing civilizations. At the edge of the underdunes stand the ruins of two men, remains of a city built in testament to the power and hubris of the four pharaohs of ascension. Rumors suggest that the Quadrumvirate's burial pyramid is located to the southwest of their capital, within recently uncovered ruins that date back more than 6,000 years. And between these ruins and pyramids, the bizarre Androsphinx of Zukebri has stood since antiquity, although its origin is much murkier, and its recent history is far more forbidding. Places of interest in the region include Ancelota. This mysterious pyramid, located near the ruins of two men, is linked to a magical pact that united and eventually destroyed the four pharaohs of Ascension more than 6,000 years ago. It is said that Ancelota houses the secrets to the pharaoh's powerful pact. Ancelota is featured in the standalone Pathfinder module, The Pact Stone Pyramid. An Alak. Relatively isolated from the rest of Assyria, this small community centers on the temple of An Alak, and nearly all inhabitants are devout worshippers of Eruri. Anilak began as a tiny trading outpost during the heyday of ancient Assyrian, but once Erori's faithful realized that its remote location and slow way of life lent itself to quiet meditation, the settlement's numbers swelled. Nearly 1,500 souls, mostly Kelish now, live in this regimented society, which in all aspects is focused on self-perfection. The temple is also known for its divinely inspired botanists, who cultivate a rare hand-shaped desert fruit known as the Saffron Star. El Shalad 
Once a sprawling slave encampment housing just a fraction of the hordes that built two men, El Shalad has become a city defined by fierce political struggles and racial tension. The primary players are those loyal to Assyrian and those who would rather see the city pay fealty to the Padishah Empire of Kalesh across the Abari Ocean. Indeed, although the city's roots are decidedly Assyrian, it was not until Kadirans usurped leadership of the country, turning it into a Kalashite satrapy, that El Shalad bloomed, largely because the resulting influx of Kalashites into the city strengthened its economy. When Kemet I rose to power, he promptly installed a loyal governor in El Shalad. As a sign of good faith to its Kalashite citizens, though, the fourth bringer allowed the city's ruler to retain the traditional Kadiran title of Wali. That gesture did not dissipate the political tension in the city, however, and the animosity between El Shalad's Assyrian loyalists and Kalashite sympathizers has never subsided. The city has since become known for its tumultuous elections, which until recently produced a string of Garundi governors loyal to Sothis. The latest victor, however, Sarita Senbi, is Kelishite and thus deeply distrusted by El Shalad's Garundi residents. Needless to say, rumors of voter fraud or election rigging persist each time a new Wali takes office, with the loudest grumblings always coming from the wealthiest residents. Both the Surah district, where affluent Assyrian loyalists live, and the Alzale district, home to prosperous Kelishite sympathizers, include private docks and easy access to the city gates. Temples to Nethys and Sarenre, respectively, dominate the centers of the Sura and al Zaleh districts. However, neither faction is particularly religious, and many say the continued prominence of both sects is merely a way for the two sides to accentuate their differences. Both districts enjoy proximity to the Obari market, where all manner of fresh seafood, lush textiles, and magical trinkets are sold. Also, near the city's wealthy districts is the Wali's Manor a sprawling governmental building, and a manse complete with several domed spires and towers. Its current occupant is Wali Sarita Senbi, eldest daughter of a prominent Kalashite family and the first open opponent of the Assyrian government to hold office. Sarita's recent election sparked a week of rowdy though non-violent protests. Stoking those protests, of course, were the city's prominent Assyrian sympathizers, led by Assad Arani, who secretly hopes to one day become Wali himself. A tall Garundi man with a powerful presence, Assad has been amassing political support by parlaying his prominent positions at Shalad Madrasa, the city's small but prestigious spellcasting academy. Further complicating the city's social structure is its citizens' shared distaste for elves. The origins of this racial intolerance are murky, but most scholars attribute it to the tumultuous years directly following the usurpation of the throne by Kemet I in 4609, when opportunistic elven thieves and mercenaries tried to seize control of the city's lucrative fishing industry. The city's humans and its new Assyrian government quashed the elves' efforts in short order, but El Shalad citizens have a long memory. A number of elves and half-elves still live in the city despite this animosity, and at least one among their number, a half-elf of mixed Vauranoi and Kelishite descent, is the leader of the city's most notorious thieves' guild, called the Ruby Urchins. Kawit Haider is her name, and she hates all members of the upper class with impunity and quietly works to subvert them in any way she can. The Sphinx Basin the Sphinx Basin has been populated since before written history. Its fertile land and mild climate provide shelter for isolated tribes after Earthfall turned northern Garin to desert. The area was home to feuding nomadic tribes until Asgad founded Sothis in the shadow of his slain foe Ulunat. But even then, many small settlements dotted the basin. Since Osirian's rise, the long, narrow river valley has been the center of the civilization, the sturdy trunk from which all of its various branches depend. Yet the great cities of the River Sphinx with the exception of the ancient capital of Sothis, are all recent by the standards of the ancient civilization. Of the three cities to the south, Tefu is the oldest, built near the end of the First Age of Assyrian. An wasn't built for another century after that, and Wati was built only a couple hundred years before the Kadiran invasion. The slow growth of the smaller sister cities eventually transformed the Sphinx Basin into a broader population center, rather than leaving the region to remain merely the hinterlands of Sothis. The heart of the Sphinx Basin is the River Sphinx, among the largest rivers on Garand. The river is wide and lazy, all the way from its confluence at Wati to its marshy delta north of Sothis. The banks are naturally boggy and clotted with the papyrus reeds, lotus flowers, and other swampy verdure. But this has been cleared away for most of its length in favor of easy navigation and maximized farmland. The Sphinx floods in a yearly cycle, rejuvenating the farmland and forcing villages to be evacuated and rebuilt. Consequently, the settlements along the Sphinx are portable, the buildings are constructed of wood and reeds, and sit on permanent stone foundations much of the year, but can be carried inland when the river floods. The sister cities of An, Tefu, and Wati combined have only half the population of Sothis, but their close proximity and industry give them a certain cultural heft that thousands of farmers spread along the length of the Sphinx can't match. 
One day, perhaps, the springs of Sothis will reach their limits, the sister cities will hit their stride, and the relationship will reverse. In the meantime, the cities take comfort in their relative position as sophisticated islands in a sea of rustic farmland and desert. While the sister cities are in Sothis's shadow, Totra sits alone along the coast of the inner sea, controlling the lion's share of the trade through the Assyrian desert and out across the sea. Places of interest in the region include Sothis. We have to start with the capital, the seat of pharaonic power and the nation's largest and most influential city. Sothis is the heart of Assyrians' culture, politics, and economy. Its population sprawls to the edge of the river Sphinx's fertile floodplain, flourishing among the scattered springs and oases reputed to have sprung from the splattered blood of Ulanat, a spawn of Rovagug whose immense scarab-like shell now looms over the city's skyline. But it's the presence and influential patronage of the pharaoh that truly elevates Sothis to its status as the first city of Assyrian. From the ruby prince, it is said, flow all good things, and the bustling, thriving city in the desert is living proof. The industrial and residential areas of Sothis are consigned to the area beyond the city proper by ever-growing array of civic monuments, offices, and palaces springing up near the Black Dome and the Palace of the Fourth Bringer. Monuments line the major roads into the capital and dot the old city, where visitors can spend days gazing at the impressive architecture as the work of the city buzzes on across the Crimson Canal. As both a national capital and a vast metropolis, Sothis plays host to a few very large and complex intertwined bureaucracies. The Council of the Sun and Sky represent all of Assyrian, but meddles constantly in city politics, especially under the leadership of First Speaker Danachrist Phi, the outspoken and populist former slave. The first captain of the Risen Guard, sworn to protect the Ruby Prince, is also commander of the Eyes of Sothis, whose duty is to maintain the peace and sweep crime from the city. The holder of these titles sets aside his name and former identity and adopts the name of his favoured weapon, for he is nothing but a weapon whose sole purpose is to protect the pharaoh and his capital. Currently, the Kopeshman of Sothis fills this role, having taken up the mantle from the Spearwoman of Sothis in 4704. Finally, there is the great pharaoh himself. Ruling from the Black Dome, which towers above the skyline of Sothis, the ruby prince Kemet III has responsibility for all of Assyrian and has the nearly impossible task of juggling the many interests of his diverse constituents while also trying to transform Assyrian itself from an ancient civilization to a modern nation. It is no small task. One might think Sothis is situated upon the River Sphinx itself, but that is not entirely correct. Sothis is in fact situated 12 miles from the River Sphinx, far from the seasonal floods and necessary agriculture to sustain such a large city. The Crimson Canal, constructed during the early days of ancient Assyrian, allows maritime and river trade to feed and provision Sothis without relying on overland travel. The canal is quite wide, and river traffic is well organized as a result of a right-of-way system and a guild of pilots who direct ships up and down the waterway. Watchers on the eye of Sothis, the canal's sole island, oversee the entire operation. The boat pilots who ply the canals are common brokers of information regarding the movements of prominent Sothins and the whereabouts of notable shipments. They can be powerful allies to smugglers and bounty hunters alike, but the head of the boatman's guild will have none of it. She is the upstanding Bonuat ex-slave Sidewise Kepitel, Lady of the Canals, who discourages all illicit activity among her fellow pilots. In this city, three massive temples draw forth the faithful to prayer. The necropolis of the faithful is shepherded by the Church of Phrasma, a never-expanding presence in southwestern Sothis. On a daily basis, the necropolis bustles with mourners and loved ones, along with scores of Phrasman clerics who aid these visitors and maintain the funerary edifices and walkways. The Temple of the All-Seeing Eye is a sprawling compound of concentric temples, centered on the reconstructed spire of Asgad. The inner circles of the temple and the spire itself are restricted to clerics of Nethys, though it's said that the ruby prince walks those halls on occasion. As the largest temple to Nethys, in a city reputedly founded in part by the god himself, the Temple of the All-Seeing Eye is regarded by its clergy, as well as many of the faithful at large, as the preeminent shrine to the god of magic. Finally, the Temple of the Eternal Sun. Sothis's premier temple to Sarenre is a striking combination of Kadiran and Assyrian architecture, as the temple is built into the former palace of the Kadiran satraps. The cult of the Dawnflower cemented its relationship with the Fourth Bringer dynasty by handing over all of the treasures belonging to the late satrap, though the temple itself, decorated with Assyrian and Saranite iconography, is luxuriant beyond description. On. An is known as the City of Triangles because of the aesthetically intriguing symmetry and prominence of the shining mountains to the northeast and the great pyramids to the south, the most prominent of which is the Pyramid of Camaria the Brazen. 
Since its appellation stuck, the city has tried to live up to its name. Much of the architecture and street layout is triangular. One of the city's most noteworthy features is the series of pyramids that serve as civic buildings, housing living scribes and bureaucrats instead of dead pharaohs. Most of Arn is set back from the Sphinx River, and a great stone levee protects it from yearly floods. The Wharf District, on the other hand, is entirely wooden, set on pilings that allow it to rise and fall during the flood season. As with all of the Sphinx River cities, An is an agricultural center, but it also has many marble and sandstone quarries, which account for much of its major trade up and down the Sphinx. The rectilinear pits and ridges of the quarries are put to good use once the usable stone is gone, converting to underground warehouses, granaries, and even apartment blocks for the steadily growing population. The recent antiquities rush caused by the Ruby Prince opening the deserts to outside exploration has boosted the local economy. Even the well-picked pyramids in the vicinity have attracted adventurers eager to find something the last thousand have overlooked. The hope isn't entirely unreasonable, as adventurers fairly regularly discover minor tombs or side chambers, even in long ransacked areas. Tefu. Known as the city of the reed people, Tefu sits on a small rise in the marshy region where the crook meets the asp and the sphinx begins. The reeds of the marshes are the material from which papyrus is created, so Tefu has always been closely identified with scribes and learning. The Tefu Academy of Scribes trains the army of young scholars who ultimately fill the ranks of the temples, universities, and imperial bureaucracy. The city boasts one of the largest libraries in the Inner Sea region. Its contents date back to the era of ancient Assyrian and have been carefully guarded for millennia, which saved many key documents, whose other, more accessible copies were destroyed during the Kadiran Purge. Access to these archives is highly sought after by Assyriantologists, explorers, and treasure hunters hoping to glean knowledge of sites missed by less careful eyes, a fact that the city's current governor, Deca and Karet, exploits economically and for political influence. Wati Wati is called the half-city, a legacy of the terrible Lamashtu spawned plague that ravaged it hundreds of years ago, killing half its population. The city was abandoned entirely, then later reclaimed by the Church of Phirasma, whose temple is still the most important civic building in town. Half of the original city was left to the dead, a sprawling, ruinous zone inhabited only by desert creatures and those who would loot the dead and risk the wrath of the living. The living part of Wati, however, has continued to expand, and now eclipses the dilapidated portion by almost three quarters. But the memory of those lost is still a palpable presence in what is today still a macabre city. Totra. The city of Totra is the second largest port in Assyrian after Sothis, a spectacular natural harbor surrounded by headlands and ridges that protect it from storms of both sea and sand. The harbor of Totra is actually three separate harbors, divided by dual peaks, the outer harbor, the deep harbor, and the shallow harbor. The city's three harbors, overseen by the harbor watch, whose ranks are such that even when the harbor is bustling with incoming and outgoing vessels, the flow of ships through the various checkpoints never causes backups or delays. This efficiency is largely due to the influence of harbor master Jira Odin, who possesses a preternatural connection to the harbors, the vessels within, and the flow of goods flowing throughout the city. Tatra's economy is fueled by its wonderful harbors and its convenient location. The city is more convenient to Western Assyrian than it is to Sothis, and it's a logical stopping place for ships that don't wish to thread the Sphinx Delta to reach the capital. Tatra has gotten an additional boost recently, with the increase in antiquities trade, and even the heavy taxes levied by the Ruby Prince haven't been able to keep up with the waxing profits of the city's merchant princes. That doesn't keep them from complaining, however, but as they say publicly at every opportunity, they are the most loyal of Assyrians. Tatra was founded during the An dynasty, and was central to the Great Atokwa, the slavery-fueled push to annex Thuvia and Rahadum. The city acquired many of those slaves and used them to bedeck itself with monuments and great architectural feats. Ultimately, Tatra rivaled Sothis for its number of monuments, pyramids, sphinxes, obelisks, and palaces. When ancient Osirian fell, Tatra's new Kadiran rulers destroyed and defaced much of the city's splendor, scarring Tatra and littering it with their own monuments. The harbors of Tatra were full of toppled statues and rubble that were once great works of art and beauty. Tatra suffered more than most places during the time of the Kadiran satrapy, partially because it had more to lose. Because of its status as a trade hub, it also attracted many Kalashites from Kadira and beyond, ruthless traders who used the patronage of their ruling compatriots to edge the locals out of the market. These days, the city is finally beginning to regain its former glory. The push to reclaim the past is best typified by the giant and defiant statue of An Hepsu II that graces the center of the outer harbor, whose monstrous base was constructed largely from destroyed Kadiran monuments. Today, the city is governed by Governor Heplitas, a tight-lipped Osiriani man who keeps his own council, though he claims to be slavishly devoted to every whim of the great pharaoh in Sothis. Mm -hmm.